So they were putting this headset on me uh, out back, and I don't know what it is about headsets like these that sort of go around your neck. It always makes me feel like I'm Kylie Minogue. And um, we were practicing a couple of dance moves out back, the crew and I, and then they, they saw my dance moves and said, probably stick with the presentation, because you, know, you really don't want to scare the crowd more than necessary. Um, so I think this was originally called Seven Things That Excite Me About the Future of Advertising, but my counting skills are absolutely terrible. So I think it's maybe more, or maybe it's a few less. I'm not entirely sure. So now it's just things that excite me about the future of advertising. This image is by a guy called Sid Mead. Those of you who love science fiction might know him. He was a set designer for a movie called Blade Runner that you may remember. He also did a movie a couple of years ago called Elysium where he got dragged out of semi-retirement. He's like really old, he's 85 or something. But a lot of the future that we dream of, he's basically created, he's drawn it and sketched it and shown it to production designers who have then built it for all these great movies. The reason why I say this is I always want to make sure I remember to tell everybody, read more science fiction. It's where people dream about the future, it's where people get inspired to make things that they see in a movie or read about in the book and they kind of go, wow, that, that needs to exist. You know, you look at, at the iPhone, and you look at the old uh, Star Trek movies, and the tricorder, and you're kind of like, huh, yeah, I see where they're coming from, and I see how this is going. So read more science fiction. That's all I have to say, and thank you. No, that's not entirely true. I have a few more things. Um, so I work for a company called Alphabet. Have any of you heard of Alphabet? Probably not. It's like a holding company that now owns Google. Uh, you've probably heard of those guys. And they own Nest and a whole bunch of other companies that do really exciting things. And... Um, I work at a specific part of Google that you may or may not have heard of. If you work in advertising, you may have heard of us, or you may not, but I'm going to talk to you about it. So after this, you will have heard about us. Um, I work at a place called The Zoo, and that's our logo. And that triangle is supposed to be a Z, like Zorro, just in case you couldn't read it. So what is The Zoo, you may very well ask, and um, frankly, I will answer it. Um, it's Google's creative think tank for brands and agencies. And whenever I say that, people look at me and go, that sounds great, what the hell does that mean? Well, the simplest way of explaining it is probably that we use Google technology in kind of fun, different, and unexpected ways to bring brands to life on various digital uh, platforms. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, starting with, whoops, this is a different kind of deck than the one that I put together later in time. Okay, we'll just riff a little bit. Um, but the way we think about uh, the, the work that we do at the zoo is that we are 100% focused on the end user experience. With Google, it's always about the end user and what the end user sees, does, touches, feels, etc. So the focus when Google builds products is always on the end user experience, and this, we try to apply the same kind of thinking to any product we do that's commercially uh, driven. Let's see if this is actually what I expect to be next. Yep, here we go. So. You might ask yourself, what the hell is this? Um, this is like a fun little prototype that we were building for um, a project for a client who sells toothbrushes. And you might ask, what does this have to do with brushing your teeth? Well, does anybody know how long you're supposed to brush your teeth to make them really clean? Two minutes. Most people have no idea uh, how long two minutes are. If I started, each and every one of you, Counting up to two minutes, one would be done in about 45 seconds, some of you in five minutes. Uh, it's like no one really knows how long two minutes are. So how do you get people to actually brush their teeth for two minutes? Well, we thought maybe we'll just give them a visual marker of when the two minutes have actually passed so they can stop brushing their teeth when the two minutes are up or they can continue if they're running behind and haven't brushed them for long enough. So we created this little thing that actually connects to your phone uh, via Bluetooth, and you can set it up in various ways to read, you know, whether it's your uh, emails or whether it's text messages or whatever news, whatever makes you happy in the morning. It can play a short song, a two-minute song, if you have one of those. So it started out as this little fun prototype on a desk of one of my colleagues, and now it's looking a little bit like this, a little bit more advanced, and um, we hope that they will bring this product to market within the very foreseeable future. So that's one project we worked on. Um, another project, I'll show you a video. Uh, it's a, um, a project we worked with our good friends at Colenso BBDO in Auckland on. And um, it's for pedigree, pedigree dog food. 
And you know, my very, very first ad that I ever did was actually for uh, dog food, way back in the day before digital, when we were still shooting dogs jumping over cliffs and whatnot. And I still remember that the brief was, we have to show the breeder, we have to show the dogs, we have to show the breeder with the dogs, we have to show the dogs eating, and we have to have a, a shot of the food, and we have to have a pack shot. It all has to fit into 30 seconds. And I looked at, at the client and kind of go, what do you need from us? Uh, oh, big idea, big idea. Like, okay, uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, anyway, this is much more interesting and a lot more fun. I'll show you the video. Losing your dog is a heartbreaking ordeal, which is why we created Pedigree Found, the free lost dog alert that moves faster than your dog. Just register your dog with Found, and then, if they ever go missing, you simply push one button. Within seconds, thousands of lost dog alerts are posted across mobile ads in a two and a half kilometer radius activating an army of scouts that will get your dog home safely and quickly. Missing dog posters and neighborhood flyers have long been the way to let locals know you've lost your pooch. Now a new smartphone app aims to do the same thing. So this technology is really uh, world first in terms of utilizing our Google Display Network as well as Dynamic Creative to deliver a real-time message in a very finite location and using geolocation targeting. It's the first of its kind globally and we're hoping it's just the start of many more to come. This goes way beyond just creating an app. Working with Google, we've developed a new way to use display advertising that can combine uh, the buying power of Mars with real-time geotargeted communications to help solve deeply personal, localized problems. So thanks to Pedigree Found, your dog won't stay lost for long. Pedigree Found, the lost dog alert that moves faster. It was very successful. We found a lot of lost dogs, and, um, <laughs> and we're going to roll it out around <coughs> the world now with our friends at Mars and Pedigree. But what I really wanted to talk a little bit about today it's not what we do necessarily. There's some Google stuff in there. There's also a couple of other things in there. It's mostly about how do we interface with the digital world? You know, we've gone from the giant desktop to the laptop to now the mobile phone, or, I mean, is it even really a phone anymore? It's just an ultra-portable computer. And now we're sort of spreading even further out. We're using the phone to access virtual realities. We're uh, using headsets to access even more virtual things, and we are beaming things straight onto people's eyeballs. So we're finding new and different ways of interacting with the digital world. And I wanted to talk about a few of those that I find really interesting. Do I just talk right into it? I am Canadian. Good afternoon. It's not opening. Come on. Yeah. I am Canadian. Oh, we need to say it in different languages. Oh. After six, you know, just, no way. Do you guys know any other languages? Yes, we Canadian. Yeah. I'm Canadian. Oh, I'm Canadian. I think we got this. Soy I'm Canadian. I'm Japanese. And they Canada we name. Yeah, Canadians. Some Canadian. Canadian. Just so Canadian. Canada. Um, Canadian Southern Unica.
I love this because it's, it's an example of something that has divided people forever, which is language. It's actually no longer dividing people, it's bringing them together, it's unifying people uh, in a task that they're all uh, doing together. And language becomes the great unifier and brings you beer towards the end of it through the use of a simple technology that's really not so simple, actually, at the end of the day. But it does allow you to recognize uh, languages. Don't, have any, any of you used uh, Google Translate on your phone and you hold it over like um, a menu in a restaurant or a street sign or whatever? And all of a sudden you see it appear in the language that, uh, um, that you want it to? I mean, for me, that is probably the closest we will get to magic in my lifetime. And I'm blown away having traveled a lot in my youth and kind of been walking around with little dictionaries and learning how to say the simplest things. So this, for me, is fantastic. How are we doing backstage, guys, with this? Because there's more videos coming. <laughs> I don't know if I can riff on all of them. Um, but let's try. So this one is definitely going to be challenging to riff on. Um, how many of you were in, uh, in Cannes? this summer, to the, uh, went to the advertising festival. Anyway, one, two, like a handful of people. Okay, so there's probably many of you who haven't seen this since it was, uh, a, it's a case study from Australia that wasn't widely seen around the world because it was very specific to Australia. Um, did you know that people are more afraid of being eaten by sharks than is, in, is reasonable in any way, shape, or form? People are terrified of getting eaten by sharks. Sharks and spiders are like two of the things that scare people the most, um, even though the amount of people who actually die from shark and spider attacks is so small to not really matter at all. Well, of course, except for the people who actually get eaten by a shark. It does matter to them. Um, but I saw a statistic that more people every year die from being involved in an unfortunate situation with a vending machine. Now, exactly how people die from interacting with vending machines, I'm not entirely sure. In my head, it's about having your arm stuck inside the vending machine on a Friday night trying to steal something, and then everybody leaves, and you kind of have to bite your arm off at some point, and you die a horrible, grisly death that way. But that's just that's how my mind works. Hopefully, that's not the case. Optus, Australia's second largest telecoms provider, briefed us to improve the perception of their network. In response, we found an unlikely opportunity to confront one of our country's most infamous problems. Australia has the most fatal shark attacks in the world, four times more than any other country, and methods to deter sharks haven't changed in over 60 years. This year, the problem got so bad, the Western Australian government sanctioned the culling of all large sharks. Thousands of people have rallied against WA's shark cull policy. So we asked ourselves, could we use the Optus network to help protect our beachgoers and our sharks? Introducing Cleverboy, a smart ocean boy that detects sharks and sends instant alerts to lifeguards via the Optus network. The boy detects the sharks by using a breakthrough sonar system we developed that measures the shark's unique movement. Once a shark has been detected, a real-time message is sent to the lifeguard towers via the Optus network. Cleverboy is a digital utility that could be the answer to the shark problem in Australia and worldwide. One that's more efficient, economical and humane. World's first shark detection technology to help prevent attacks. Since launch, it's... Cleverboy has featured in over 800 global news stories, earning an audience of over 40 million through PR and social. Our brief was to change the perception of the Optus network. Now with Cleverboys under commercial development and the leader of the New South Wales government funding public trials, we created an entirely new use for the Optus network, one that could change beach safety forever. So I'm running a little late because of all this, I'm going to skip uh, through this, but the reason why I love this is because you know, the Internet of Things, which could be a whole presentation in and of itself, is essentially about making dumb things smart and making dumb things communicate to other things so we can stop problems like running out of milk and being eaten by sharks. Like I said, that in itself is a whole presentation, but I love this as an example of how something really simple can be turned into an advantage. How many of you have tried cardboard? About a handful of you. Um, 
A lot of people's first experience with virtual reality is going to be through cardboard. It's uh, cheap. It's essentially a piece of cardboard with a couple of lenses attached. You insert your mobile phone into it, and all of a sudden you can move around in a virtual reality. It's a really simple way of uh, sort of taking that first step. And a couple of million people have tried it at this point. We've handed out an enormous amount of, uh, of Google Cardboards to various different um, institutions and brands, et cetera, et cetera. You can brand them as well. You get your logo on there and make it look very nice, uh, even though it is made of cardboard and hence uh, relatively cheap. I wanted to show you a couple of things that we've done with cardboard that I think is really fascinating. Uh, I'll just voice over these videos, I guess, just to, in the hope that maybe you'll get something out of it. Oh. different places, you have the chance to actually learn something new. You want to be able to show the kids that there's something outside of your community that you could go to and learn from and that there's other places you can visit. All right, so let's do our objective and we'll talk about the lesson for today. We're going to take a field trip to Verona, Italy to see the place where Romeo and Juliet lived. I'm going to take you on this field trip under the water. Okay, you guys are going to pick up Excuse your devices and look in your cardboard. What is that? It allowed us to go somewhere we wouldn't normally be able to go. Where are we in China? This is the Great Wall of China. We got to see the place itself so we could actually understand what she was talking about. How long would it take to walk the length of the Great Wall of China? So much more enriching than just showing them a picture or just having them read about it. This device can actually make us go to places that we've never been before. It brings the lesson to you. You have to see it for yourself to believe it. There's so much other places to see, so you know that it's never going to end. Well, thank God the audio came back because I was trying to remember what all the kids were saying and sort of doing it as a little bit of a play, and that would probably not have worked out quite as well. Um, I love this. I don't know about you guys' geography books when you were kids, but my geography books were essentially a description of how many people lived there, how much it was mountainous, how much was farmland, and there was a small picture of a place. I mean, the way kids these days can actually go for a walk on the Chinese wall, or even better, actually, we can take them to places and make them understand situations that they couldn't or shouldn't be part of, like going to a refugee camp and experiencing life through the eyes of a kid in a refugee camp. So there's many, many ways of using this for education that um, I think is absolutely astounding. Have any of you uh, seen that yet? So I'm not going to show you the whole. Uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because you really have to experience it through a, a virtual reality device. It's a super cool, uh, kind of six-minute-long film where you really are placed in the middle of a sort of an alien attack, and uh, it's a group at Google called ATAP, Advanced Technologies and Projects, that are working on what does storytelling look like in a world where you navigate uh, content slightly differently. You know, we've always been used to well, approximately 160 degrees right, of interaction with uh, movies. What changes in storytelling when all of a sudden you're interacting with movies, you're walking around trying to find out where the action is and can experience films differently? I find that really fascinating. And uh, it's a new mode of storytelling that we haven't really cracked yet and no one has. So you guys could be the next Orson Welles, any one of you in this particular field of storytelling. So where it gets really interesting is, you know, everybody is putting out these headsets, Next year or the year after, there will be a plethora of headsets available for people to purchase uh, from a lot of different manufacturers. But what it really comes down to with this is content. It's going to be about what type of content will be available for people to watch and how will they engage with this content. And what makes me really happy is when I see this next video and seeing how some of the more interesting uh, storytellers in the world are actually dabbling in this and are about to release some stuff that I think will change uh, our perception of what storytelling can be.
I think when you get a room full of creatives from movies and video games and the technical sector, what we've got, and you get them all in the same space, you're going to create something pretty exciting. Thanks to the coming of a new generation of Star Wars films, ILM, Skywalker Sound, and Lucasfilm itself are engaged in the creation and expansion of a universe on a scale that's never been seen before. We've been creating virtual worlds for a long time, but when you can actually see it in front of you in real time and interact with it, to grab an iPad and drag around on the screen and instantly see the results of your creative decision, it completely changes the kind of experiences we can make. We're starting to push the envelope on what we think is possible to be shown in a real time environment. We're entering a, an age of immersive entertainment where it is possible to collapse the walls that separate us from story experiences. Imagine you are watching a scene, but then you were able to pass through the invisible wall that seems to separate you from that movie. You can go further into the world in which the story is taking place. No one really knows how audiences are going to experience virtual reality and augmented reality and immersive cinema. But I do know that we have the most expansive universe to explore in Star Wars. The trick is figuring out what storytelling looks like in that space. And part of what I'm excited about that's going on here is we're being afforded the opportunity to ask ourselves that question and explore that together. We've created XLab as a place where we combine the story department inside Lucasfilm, ILM, Skywalker Sound, and the technology available to us to create experiential entertainment. The mission of ILMX Lab is to create completely new experiences. We're actually opening our doors now for the first time for experienced creators to collaborate with us. I think we are experiencing a renaissance with experiential storytelling. That's something that in a way George did with the first Star Wars. He recognized that storytelling and technological innovation go hand in hand. And that's something that as a company, we're uniquely suited to do. I don't know about you guys, but I am super excited about the next Star Wars movie coming out in about six weeks or so. I already bought tickets for it, but that to me looks like it might be even more fun than actually watching the movie to step inside of it and actually get to play a real part in that universe. So the last example of, of kind of virtual or augmented reality that I'm going to show you is this company that Google has invested a lot of money in that is really fascinating to me as well. It's called Magic Leap. And they don't have, they don't really have a product to show to the world yet. I keep nagging them to give me a demo, but I have a couple of friends who had a demo of this and they say it's literally mind blowing. What they do is they project images onto your retina. They literally blast lasers onto your eyes. Now, the effect of that is that you cannot distinguish what's being projected onto your eyeball from actual reality. So you literally will not be able to tell the difference of there being an elephant in your hands or if there is actually not an elephant in your hands, which most likely there is not. Um, but they released a demo a little while ago that kind of showed what this could look like in an office setting. So I'm going to play for you guys.
mean, imagine that, just turning your office into the playing field for pretty much anything you want to do, or your backyard, your house, this theater, we could all be running around shooting aliens in here. I think the, the promise of this is truly fascinating, and um, I mean, we're probably not going to see a consumer product in the next year, but who knows, they could be just keeping it very, very secret. Let me talk about a couple of projects that we're doing at Google that are sort of very cutting edge of how you interface with the world as well. I may have to skip one of them since we're running out of time. This big screen tells me here. But Project Jacquard is essentially a way of, of weaving uh, controls into clothing. So we're doing a project working with Levi's, uh, trying to make your pants interactive. Now, that sounds incredibly silly. Um, but imagine if you could turn the volume for your TV up and down just by rubbing uh, your jeans like up or down, or change the channels, or any interesting thing where having your clothes be the interface uh, would be a way of engaging with uh, the reality around you. I'm going to skip the video because it's a little long and we don't have a lot of time, because uh, I want to talk a little bit about this as well. How many of you have heard of Project Soli? Not a lot of you. So Project Soli is kind of... It, it actually reminds me a little bit of, um, of magic. It uses radar to detect uh, hand movements. So you can essentially just use your hands to control pretty much uh, anything that has an embedded solely chip. Now, if you think back to the Harry Potter movies or to you know, Lord of the Rings, etc., when they do magic, it's almost always something with hand movements and incantations, etc. As far as I know, there are no incantations uh, involved in Project Soli, although there could be. Um, but controlling the world around you just with simple hand movements, uh, I think, is, is taking almost the idea of the interface to the ultimate lowest uh, denominator extreme by removing it completely. And um, hopefully they'll, they'll take that from the experimental stages in now and turn it into something consumer-facing in, uh, in the near future. I'm really fascinated by this particular um, technology. But I talk a lot about technology, and I talk a lot about um, you know, what we can do with it and how it's going to change the world, etc. One thing, going back to what I was saying about um, thinking like Google and always focusing on the user first, one thing you should always keep in mind when you're playing with these technologies is that, yes, there are constantly advances and leaps and bounds in terms of what the technology can do, but people tend to stay more or less the same. I mean, we all love you know, our kids, we love to eat, uh, some people love to run. I don't particularly, but I get it. Um, we all have things that we're passionate about, things we like to do, and that fundamentally doesn't change all that much. It's just that the way we do it sometimes changes when technology takes a, a jump ahead. But always keep, keep in the back of your mind that you're talking to human beings. Um, and if you don't believe me, I have statistics that can actually prove it. So if you do a, a search on Google Trends, and compare the searches for the words hangover cure with the words best of Netflix, you'll see that there's an absolute correlation uh, between the two searches over time. So humans will remain humans. The hangover cure is watching a trashy movie that has not changed, nor is it likely to ever change. I'll leave you with um, a video of something that's so low tech that you can't even imagine it until you see this. It was done by our friends at uh, Ogilvy in Argentina, and uh, it won a bunch of awards uh, this, this year. And first time I saw it, it just absolutely cracked me up, because you don't get more low-tech than this. But in a way, it's really amazing. Oh, I skipped that slide as well. Let me actually say something about this right before. I sort of trying to make sure that my count, counter here don't go down, doesn't go down until I'm done. Anyway, I want you to think of Google technology as Lego, because essentially you can put it together in a bazillion different ways. You can build more or less anything your heart desires. And that's the fun part of being in my job and working with the 140 fantastic colleagues I have around the world who tinker and play around and build all kinds of amazing things. So think of Google as Lego and just approach it from a tinkerer perspective. Then you'll have a lot of fun with it as well. And now, a very low-tech video to wrap things up. In rugby, wounds heal, cuts mend, bruises disappear, but teeth, they are lost forever. Salta Beer, main sponsor of the Salta Rugby Union, presents Beard Tooth Implant. An idea to reward players who gave everything they've got on the field, including their teeth. Through social media, we summoned these toothless gladiators to give them back what they'd lost in battle. But we weren't going to give them a simple tooth back. We developed a unique dental implant, a specially designed tooth 
to open beer. Estamos incorporando una función que es completamente innovadora. A la masticación de los premolares le agregamos una nueva función, la del destapado de botella. Ya tenemos la pieza preparada para poder colocársela al paciente y que pueda funcionar abriendo la botella de esta manera. Never had a brand been so close to its target audience. In fact, Salta Beer was getting into its target audience, literally. And after two months, they were ready for their implant. Vamos a ver eso. Perfecto. Vamos a probarlo. An absolute success. They were ready to jump into action. For the love of rugby, we designed something that will change third halves forever. And in less than 48 hours, outstanding numbers. Oh my goodness, what a lot of share. <laughs> that indeed. All right, that's all the, the hype that you have to have in these videos. But what a wonderful low-tech thing. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties and have a good night, guys. <laughs>